Can everyone hear me? So it's clear that we should have put the tables in the front and the chairs in the back, correct? Is that how it works? Um, so uh, I'm not used to standing at the podium, so this will be hard for me. Um, good morning. How is everybody? I would put my glasses on so you can see, but then I can't read. That's a problem. I guess I need to get those transition lenses. Anyway, so um, it is my privilege to be able to introduce our first speaker of the day. Uh, but before I give you all the interesting uh, background about CT, I want to tell you how I first met him. So it was 2012, I believe it was, I had been asked to participate in an evaluation of technology for Compass. Who knows what Compass is? Raise your hand. Compass is our, our, our clinical data warehouse um, at the Anschutz Medical Campus. And so I sat down, and there were a number of us that were going to be the evaluators, and I sat down beside this unassuming gentleman, and he introduced himself as C.T. Lin. And as I got to talking to C.T., I realized, wow, this dude's smart. And so the more and more I talked to C.T., I, I learned more about him, and I learned I need to start using better words, bigger words, and um, really make him think that I'm smart too because this guy is the real deal. And after meeting him, I've had lots of conversations, lots of opportunity to have individual conversations, uh, participate in different committees with him. And the more and more I, I, I speak with CT, every single time he impresses the hell out of me. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met, the most, one of the most informed people I've ever met. Um, he is a, uh, a medical doctor who understands technology probably better than me, and that's what I do for a living. So um, the, what I took away from the interaction from CT is to always listen to CT and pay attention. But uh, CT is a professor of medicine in the University of Colorado School of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine. CT conducts research on patient-physician online interaction, patient access to test results and open notes, usability and readability of EHRs, physician burnout, and resilience. He also teaches and mentors students, residents, physicians, and informatists, and CIOs in patient care, advanced empathy, communication skills, systems thinking, and design thinking, innovation, and resilience. Oh, and he also continues to do clinical care when he has the opportunity. Um, in CT's spare time, he also carries out the duties of the chief medical information officer at the University of Colorado Health and heads a 32-member physician informatics team. He deploys and optimizes a system-wide full-suite electronic health record epic as we know it, across seven hospitals and 400-plus ambulatory clinics. CT co-led effort for UC Health's EHR achieving HIMSS analytic stage 7 certification in 2016 for both patient and ambulatory care. Of note, under CT's leadership, UC Health was one of 27 organizations nationally awarded the most wired advanced in 2017. CT did his undergraduate work in Harvard, earned his medical degree from Stanford, and performed his internship and residency at the University of California Davis Medical Center. With all that being said, you should really listen to what he has to say, as I learned the very first time I met him. Whew, that was a lot, wasn't it? So it is my honor to introduce my friend, CT Lin. Good morning. Who knows what a Yottabyte is? Hopefully none of you, because otherwise what's the point, right? <laughs> so I have nothing significant to disclose, except some very uh, unruly children. <laughs> Here are my learning objectives. A grain of rice adds up quick. Things are ridiculous until they aren't. Technology doesn't always benefit humans. And what are the possible solutions? And if you're an academician, my learning objectives are in gray there. So. so we were sold to build goods. When I was growing up, I, I thought, clearly, by the time I get into practice, I'll have a tricorder. I'll have uh, Nurse Chapel, Dr. McCoy, teaching me how to use these Ste uh, stainless steel salt shakers, true story, 1950s salt shakers were the props for the woo -woo 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 things that uh, Dr. McCoy would wave over the patient. I thought, I I'm going to enjoy practicing medicine. And what we got, in, oh, and then, uh, of course, there are other movies like Prometheus, the Med Pod. You don't need a physician anymore. Just climb inside, and the thing diagnoses you and fixes you right up, whether it's surgical, medical, doesn't matter. Right? And 
What we got is movies tell us that the movies, the future of medicine is awesome, and this is all we get. <laughs> poor, poor sad guy in the in the corner. So here's our clinical scenario or clinical correlation, right? How many physicians or clinicians in the audience? A couple of you, all right? So help us figure this out. You have a 53-year-old male with hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol, depression, comes to clinic for a six-week follow-up after starting paroxetine for depression. He's otherwise healthy, only takes aspirin, 81 milligrams, pravastatin for cholesterol lowering, and his newly started paroxetine. He asks you, could the paroxetine be making him urinate more? His finger stick is 190, which is in the range of diabetes, elevated blood sugar. But his A1C, which is a long-term measure of diabetes and blood sugar, is normal. Question is, does paroxetine cause hyperglycemia? How would you answer this question? You have access to the internet and the electronic health record. Any ideas? You don't have to be a physician. Say something crazy, Russ. Call CT. Thanks, Russ. <laughs> so you talk to your colleagues. They've never heard of this before. Any other ideas? Please. Google it. Actually, remarkably accurate as a Dr. Google is if you type symptoms into the search bar, chances are pretty good you get something interesting and reasonable. Um, so you Google it, you got nothing. You got nothing. Other ideas? Check with the manufacturer. So there, there are FDA-based disclaimers. You can read through all of the package inserts for both paroxetine and so forth. And yes, after several days of reading, you discover that there's nothing describing this phenomenon. Yes? Search the EHR for previous cases. Search the EHR for previous cases. So this is interesting. So turns out, <clears throat> for those of you who are familiar with using the Epic Electronic Health Record, there's actually a tool in our EHR and increasingly in other EHRs as well. Um, EHR, I, I'm going to use that term a bit, the Electronic Health Record. And here for our organization is the Epic Electronic Health Record. Um, there's a tool called Slicer Dicer in our device that uh, allows you to in a de-identified form, search across all 4 million patients in our database. And to your point, um, you could say, show me all patients in graphical form who, have, um, who are taking the one drug, to all those who are taking the other drug, and all those who are uh, diabetic, and see what the intersections are in the Venn diagrams. And, uh, and the answer to that, I'm going to hold on to for a minute because we were able to reproduce how the original folks who figured this out did it, which was using the broad internet, um, Google searches and Bing searches. So Microsoft has a tool called a, a Bing search, um, search bar that you can download and plug in to your browser, whether it's you know, Google Chrome, Internet Explorer, and so forth. And therefore, they were able to determine what IP address was searching for what term. Okay, so, so specifically what that means is that even though you don't know who is doing the searching and whether it's several different people sitting at that computer, the fact that a single computer had someone who was searching for the word paroxetine or the brand name of it, the word pravastatin, or symptoms of high blood sugar. I'm peeing a lot, I'm thirsty, I'm drinking a lot of water, I'm losing weight, whatever it is that corresponds to a diagnosis of high blood sugar, you can determine someone from that computer searched maybe for one of those things, two of those things, or all three. And then you can aggregate this over hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes millions of people. And that's what the Stanford researchers did. They downloaded the data on Bing searches over a period of a year and found um, that actually they're able to subcategorize those who searched for one term. And so what do, they, what do the Venn diagrams look like? It turns out folks who did not search for either drug and the dotted line along the bottom is the folks who searched for um, high blood sugar symptoms was about half of a percent of all searchers, of all IP addresses, had someone who searched for high blood sugar symptoms. But if you added in or restricted it to just those who searched for pravastatin as well as searching for high blood sugar, the signal's up to about 3%. Similarly, for paroxetine, the signal's up to 5%. And for those where on that computer, they searched for both terms and high blood sugar symptoms, now you're up to 10%. It's multiplicative. 
And there's potentially an add, not just an additive, but a multiplicative effect here. And it turns out when you go back and look through EHRs, you can reproduce this. So now we're using internet non-patient searches to determine pathophysiology, oh, right? What is it about big data that we can actually get signal out of things that we think are just complete chaos and noise? So this is an example, we think, of how big data could change the way we think about medicine. A grain of rice adds up quick. We're going to talk about big data and Moore's law. So this is an electronic health record sample. Uh, you open up the chart in reverse chronological order, all the things that this sample patient has had done, telephone calls, appointments, <laughs> visits to the emergency room, and so forth. And if you look at this data in terms of quantity, we think maybe a typical patient's chart is about 10 megabytes, if we think about size in terms of uh, um, how, how size grows over time. Or a photo taken on your smartphone, right? 10 megapixels or so, that's a lousy smartphone now. We're up to 13, 16, 32 megabytes, whatever it is. A, a 10 megapixel photo on your phone, about 10 megabytes, or 10 to the 2, or 10 to the 1. And, and on a logarithmic or an exponential scale, which is really hard to sort of get in your gut. My argument for this slide is, there's no way for your brain to go, oh, I get about how big that is, right? Am I, I'm trying to convince you, no, you don't. When you look at logarithmic or exponential scales, you don't. Because one chart grows to, for example, 2,000 charts for a particular physician's panel. That number only goes up to you know, 10 to the 3 or so. UC Health, 1.5. Some would argue we're up to 4 million patients. Um, that's up to 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. Colorado, 5 million people in the state. Uh, 317 folks in, in the United States, seven point something in the world. The amount of data indexed by Google is now up to 2.5 exabytes, which is billions and billions times more than what we would have here at UC Health. And then Google has indexed you know, over time 500 exabytes or more. And if you get all the way to the end, we believe that the internet in total encompasses about 10 to the 24th amount of megabytes uh, or about a yottabyte. So the answer is a yottabyte is 10 to the 24th. And you think, well, sure, big deal. It's a line, I, I get a line, right? Do you understand what 10 to the 24th is? I, in hindsight, don't have any idea. Because if you take this and put this into linear terms, 10 to the two is a football field. 10 to the four is across the span of Denver. 10 to the six is across the United States. 10 to the eight is to the moon. 10 to the 13 is across the solar system. 10 to the 23rd is Andromeda. Okay, that's pretty big, right? Big deal. Now you take it in terms of time. What if we had a, a 747 jumbo jet, flies about 500 miles an hour, and across a football field, that's 0.4 of a second. Across Denver, it's about two minutes. Across the United States, about four hours. To the moon, aside from the fact you'd asphyxiate first, um, 32 days. 1,400 years across the solar system, and this incomprehensible number of 10 billion solar systems worth to get to Andromeda, okay? 10 to the 24th, a yottabyte is pretty darn big. That's what we're sitting on in the internet. 10 to the 24th, all the way up top there. Okay, who's heard of the story of uh, the Persian king and the game of chess? Okay, no talking, you guys, no talking, right? So the idea is, and, and there's several versions out there, so the version I like to tell is that the, the king of Persia has this guy who invented the game of chess, brings it to him and says, look, look what I built, and the king is just so amazed and pleased that he says, I'll, I'll give you whatever you like. And uh, the inventor of chess is very humble. He says, you know, we're farmers. We're, we starve usually every winter. If I could just have a little bit of rice, that'd be great. Well how, well, how much would you like? Well, why don't we just do this? If you don't mind, just put one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard and just double it for the second square and double it again for the third square. And, you know, whatever it works out to at the end, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take those couple of barrels and, and I'll go home with you. And that, that'll be it, right? And so the, my question to you is, how much rice is that? I'll give you a minute to think about it. I don't know, a couple of barrels, right? Okay, so in your gut now, thinking about 
doubling it 64 times. How much is that? And I'm going to ask everybody, no one's going to be wrong. I have actually, everyone's going to be wrong. So raise your hand, everybody. Please put your hand up and raise it and just keep it up there. All right. Keep your hand up if you believe this is more than a couple of barrels of rice. Okay, that's easy. All right. Keep your hand up if you think this is more than the amount of rice that would cover the floor in this room to one foot deep. Oh, that's too much. No, it can't be that much, right? Keep your hand up if you think this rice would, would fill this room to the ceiling. Okay, all right, you're putting yourself out there. Okay, tell me if, if, if you feel like this is more rice than would fill this building to the top of the second floor all around the building. Yeah, it's not possible. It can't be that much. Ted, keep your hand up if you, if you think the rice would fill the contents of this building to the top. How many floors? Nine floors? Nine floors. Complete volume of this building. No, no possible. How about filling this campus, square mile of this campus, to the ninth floor all around the square mile? No, that's not possible. You guys are wrong, right? How much rice is this? The volume of Mount Everest or 1,000 times the modern production annually of rice. I argue to you, you have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about exponents. Okay? That's what we're talking about today. All right, big data. Any collection of data sets so large and complex it becomes difficult to process using traditional data analysis. Moore's Law, right? Who's heard of Moore's Law? Hopefully most of you. Observation by Dr. Moore, 1965, the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years where price falls by half. I was lucky enough to, uh, at the beginning of my career and at the end of high school, to use punch cards, right? Programming on punch cards, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, chunk, chunk. You make a spelling error, crumple up the paper, throw it away, put another card in, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, chunk. And they only run the cards at night. Right? And so you go up to the tiny window where the guy who, who babysits the computer, and you say, I wrote my program. Can you run it tonight? They're like, come back tomorrow. And, then you, and you come back tomorrow, and he goes, error on line three. Oh, come on. So you can't debug a program without giving it to the guy and letting him run it overnight. And God forbid you trip over something and your cards go scattering, your program's completely done. Right? Punch cards. And over time, the calculations per second per $1,000 has been growing in exponents. Right, And if we extrapolate further out, there are those who say that the calculations per second per thousand dollars will, and we think about, and there are some reports that we're getting about to the complexity of one mouse brain in terms of interconnectivity and calculations per second. We're heading for one human brain about 2030 or so. And you see, as the exponents continue, all human brains by about 2050, what's going to happen? I would argue we have no idea. Things, oh, and one other example, right? So there's, there's a thought that there is more calculation power in your pocket than there it was in all of Cape Canaveral at the time of the moon landing. You're walking around with it in your pocket now. That's what Moore's Law does for you over a couple of decades. So things are ridiculous until they aren't, right? Uh, most of you probably are familiar with Waze, social media, and getting advice from other drivers just passively driving around so you can see where the traffic accidents and the slowdowns are. Uber and Lyft. Um, smartphone request to transport is car ownership obsolete. Airbnb are hotels obsolete. Who would have thought in 10 years ago you'd go stay in a stranger's house, ride around in a stranger's car? Right? The Internet of Things. Right? I have a, a, a Nest thermostat at home. I upgraded finally, and then it, the thing learns from me. And the, the, the thinking is that over the course of a typical winter, uh, a Nest family will use 20 to 30% less heating energy because it knows when you're home based on infrared and Wi-Fi. And it will set, and you can teach it over time, I don't like that temperature, I don't like that temperature, and it self-corrects over time so that it knows what time you're usually up, what time you usually go to bed. If you don't seem to be around, I'll turn it back down and so forth. Uh, ring from the front door. You can answer your front door from anywhere in the world. Hey, get off my porch, right? From anywhere in the world. Amazon Dash, anyone heard of or, or tried this out? I, I've, uh, so there's a $4 button you can buy from Amazon 
and sticky it to your um, laundry machine and say, well, I'm out of tide, push the button, and it auto automatically goes on your Wi-Fi, orders it from your Prime account, tomorrow you get the tide. I've always wanted the Doritos button, but my wife won't let me get it. <laughs> And there's uh, the smart toilet, and a little bit creepy, but really interesting. How can we automate the things in our house that would give us information that we would, would de desire? And then artificial intelligence. There's the definitions of weak and strong intelligence. Weak or narrow AI is focused on a complex but specific task and to seem very intelligent at it. And strong AI is capable of all cognitive functions of a real human mind. And I think we saw on the curve, we're thinking about 2030-ish, that we get to something like that. Um, in terms of a hardware capability. So Gary Kasparov, 1997, the last human to have domain over a computer, right? Deep Blue defeats our best human player in 1997. Watson defeats our best human Jeopardy player, 2011. No, computers could, could not possibly take vague clues and give a better answer than a human, but turns out it could. And then, perhaps most soberingly, AlphaGo defeats the best human Go player in 2016. Who's heard of the game of Go? Okay, so many of you. My grandfather uh, used to beat my dad playing this. I have no idea how, to, how this works. But there are apparently more potential moves in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. That couldn't possibly be computable, right? The game of Go is a game of intuition. You know, I, I'm going to move here because I think this is going to help me later. And it turns out uh, the human player, right about the middle of game three, walked up and stood up and walked away from the table because the Go computer actually played a move that had never been done. Usually, the way you play the game of Go is in the circle within three or four spots of where your play, the other person is placing their pebbles. And this computer placed something 30, 40 spots away. No one does that. Who does that? That must have been an error. And it turns out about a half hour later in gameplay, it was the right move. What the heck is going on, right? Do our, human, our computers developing intuition, or does it look like intuition? The DARPA Grand Challenge, those of you who are around watching this 2004 event uh, and then laughing at it because no car finished the drive across the Mojave Desert for 60 miles. And in fact, cars were flipping over at the starting gate. Ha, 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 never going to happen in my lifetime. Two years later, they ran the competition again. Stanley from Stanford won that competition at 30 miles per hour across the Mojave Desert. Two years later, right? We went from that's not possible to holy smokes. And then a few years later, Pittsburgh is testing out Uber-based self-driving cars. And San Francisco is limiting it based on policy, not by technology. And Google, of course, has manufactured its first car without a steering wheel. Just get in, tell it where you want to go. Indonesia, there are 21 mining truck-driven, I mean, uh, AI-driven robots delivering ore without drivers for at least, it's, it'll be four years now. And the revolution is coming for us, right? SpaceX, anyone saw this, right? The Falcon 9 uh, blast off. Everyone knows that you go pick up boosters in the ocean somewhere and drag it back home. No, turns out they can guide themselves back down and land at the same time. Ridiculous. Google's duplex. Anyone saw this one? Right? So Google now has programmed a human-like voice to make appointments for you. And scary as heck, go listen to this on YouTube. Good evening. Hello? Um, I'd like to reserve a table for Friday the 3rd. This is the AI talking, and it can respond to the human on the other side with unanticipated questions. Go, oh, you're not available. You don't have anything for eight? Mm, how about 9.30? I mean, in the ums and the natural tone of voice makes it sound like this is an actual human. And we, we would argue that this passes the Turing test, right? The Turing test being, um, can you fool more than one third of humans on the other side of a wall as to whether you're a computer or not? And we, I would argue the weak AI, the narrow AI that's in Google Duplex and these other tasks would perhaps pass the Turing test now. What about in healthcare? Deep learning algorithm does as well as dermatologists in identifying skin cancer. Okay, so this is not just outside of healthcare. Now it's coming for us, 
right? As a primary care doc, I feel like one of the big things I can bring to my patients is, that's not cancer. Oh, you better go get that biopsied. Now we have an algorithm that matches us, not just a primary care doc, but a dermatology specialist for skill. I love emotional contagion. Turns out if you used Facebook in the early 2000s, you were probably part of an experiment. 600,000 Facebook users were randomly allocated into the experimental group, the control group. And actually, two, a slightly positive group and a slightly negative group. And the slightly positive group, their Facebook feeds were altered algorithmically by Facebook to show slightly more positive things and to suppress slightly less positive things. And the folks in the positive group posted more often and more positive things. And on the other hand, the negative group got uh, less positive items, uh, more negative items, and posted less often and tended to post more negative things. And now we have evidence of emotional contagion. You're not anywhere close to the other uh, people in your social group, but they can influence the way that you feel and behave. Similarly, Article in New England Journal 2007, spread of obesity in a large social network. This is the Framingham data that we use for uh, our data on how we diagnose uh, patients with heart disease uh, over time. And the same data set was actually pulled out to look at the chance of obesity. And it turns out the personal chance of obesity in this network is related not only to your first degree network, families and friends, but to their families and friends and to their families and friends. And so now people three relationships away from you who you don't even know have a statistically significant chance of influencing your likelihood of being overweight. What is it about networks that we don't understand that we could potentially use in healthcare? The Tricorder X Prize, anybody? Heard of this? So the X Prize, the original big item was the Space X Prize. What private company can launch something into space twice in two weeks on a reusable basis? That was the prize. There's now a tricorder X Prize. Um, there were 21 companies that bid for it. The, the prize was awarded to a device that could capture vital signs using lay people, consumers, capture vital signs and diagnose 13 diseases. 2014, there were seven finalists. Last year, there were two awards, including this company, that, of course, it looks ridiculous, like, like the DARPA challenge in 2004. Oh, anybody can put up a, a cart and put a whole bunch of devices in it. Well, that's what they did. Um, but can you imagine, with Moore's Law and the advance of technology, this becomes our future tricorder. We're on our way. Dr. Alexa, I've been sneezing and my throat is sore. Right? Amazon's positioning themselves to have a voice assistant in every home, and could that be your medical assistant, your physician's assistant, your actual physician coming out of that automated voice? Augmented reality. NASA is using the HoloLens augmented reality headset to build its new spacecraft faster. You put the lens on, and it shows you color-coded. Don't put the bolt here. Put the bolt over here. Right? And we're aware of some surgery offices looking at AR to map the imaging that we've done for the tumor and where I have to go in the head to go get it and mapping it right, looking down. So as I carve, I know exactly where the borders of this tumor are. Technology doesn't always benefit humans. Right? Cambridge Analytica, I think everyone, most people have, have heard of, where uh, looking at the behaviors and preferences of millions of Americans and maybe not using it uh, maybe using it for nefarious purposes. And of course, our, our big friend uh, Vladimir Putin uh, behind some of this as well. FBI issues a warning to patients about toys spying on their kids, and it turns out Furby, who can listen to your children, maybe is sending signals back to its manufacturer about your children's words and recordings. And do we really know what we're bringing into our home? If you were on the road on I-25 in October of 2016, you might have been passed by this truck, the first documented truck, uh, self-driving truck from Colorado, Fort Collins to Colorado Springs, delivering 50,000 cans of Bud. There are 11 million truck drivers in the United States. What is the unanticipated outcome of a successful single truck driving technology? My favorite book. Click here to kill everybody. 
right? So there's some downsides to this technology revolution. How are we going to stay ahead of it and think about it? So what are our possible solutions? And I would argue that empathy and creativity are some of those answers. I'm going to talk about the centaur, part human, part something else, and stempathy. If any of you have read Thomas Friedman, uh, whether in the New York Times or in one of his books, uh, uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, his most recent book is Here Comes Everybody, which I think is a terrible title for a book that's brilliant about globalization, technology acceleration, and climate change, and how these three big forces are going to combine to change the way we think about the world. He coins the term stempathy. And one possible solution is that those of us who are trained in STEM sciences, science, technology, engineering, math, must also work in a field that requires empathy because that is the last place that the AI will come for you. If you're a person whose job it is to manipulate Excel spreadsheets, sorry, your job's just about over. The AI can take spreadsheets and manipulate it better than anybody. But if you, if you take your science, technology, engineering skills and you apply it to humans, to communication, to requiring relationships, that's hard for the AI, at least for the near term. Right? Centaur chess brings out the best in humans and machines. And the idea that, that, that after 1997, when computers consistently beat humans, there are now human-only tournaments, there are now machine-only tournaments, and there are what are sometimes called uh, freestyle or centaur tournaments, where you allow computers and humans to participate together. And it turns out when you put them all in one room, centaur teams dominate human-only or computer-only um, teams. And in fact, the most recent champion was two mid-level grandmasters and three different AIs working on a team. Then interesting, right? So perhaps one way forward, at least for the near term, is the idea that being a human who can augment or cognitively manage um, the AI that comes from several inputs is maybe the way to go. Centaur. And there's creativity in human center design. I'm an iPhone fanatic. I've been an Apple fanatic since 1984. Um, and so the idea that the most recent iOS does some very clever things, um, it automatically turns on uh, do not disturb for you at night. It automatically turns on do not disturb for driving. If it detects that you're using Bluetooth in a car, it shuts down your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth not and so your cellular notification so that you're not tempted to reach for your phone in the middle of driving. And now it's telling you uh, every once a, once a week on Sunday, this is how you used your phone last week. And you go, oh my God, I've been on Facebook all this time. And so you, you're actually given a feedback loop to talk about, is this what you consciously choose to do? So there's some great examples, I think, coming about human-centered design. Just because you have the technology to do something fancier and more addictive doesn't mean you ought to. If you've not seen this on, face, on YouTube, maybe there's something to consider. Don't look at it now, please, just pay attention. But there is a, there is a um, video called Better Safer Care, and if you search for that plus the word EHR, you'll see that about a 14-minute video put out by an EHR interest group out of Boston uh, that talks about what would it look like if Iris, imagine Siri backwards, right? What if Iris was your virtual assistant? It's a combination, excuse me, a combination of a chat bot that's able to automatically respond to your queries and brings up the electronic health record and can record you and your patients so that over time you can look back and analyze patterns of behavior of both yourself and the patient and help take better care of the patient. So I think we're, we're coming to the end of this and thinking about you know, the grain of rice and Moore's law. Things are ridiculous until they aren't. Technology not always benefiting humans and thinking consciously about how we might manage things in the future and what possible solutions. How does it apply to us here at UC Health? Right? I go back to 1995. I started here as an assistant professor in 1995, and I was very happy to uh, scribble in my charts. Right? And I'm happy to scribble, but less happy to try to read them later. Right? But, uh, but, oh, back then, even 1995, 97, I was, uh, I was part of the, the new age because, look, I also dictated it. So, uh, so now I'm do doing double work. I'm, I'm transcribing by chicken scratch, and then I'm dictating it. And our information in our health, health system travels at the speed of a courier on Colfax. Send me the chart on Mrs. Smith. It'll be there in about three hours. I got to go pull it. Right? And so often, um, in fact, 
there's only one place that each of these charts can be. This is not multi-access, right? So you, you finish your chart, you put it away, and it gets stored in the basement on Ninth Avenue. And if your clinic is three or four blocks away, about 50% of the time, the chart doesn't show up because legal has it, or billing has it, or compliance is looking at it, or some other clinician decided to pull it for another reason, or God forbid, a researcher wanted to browse through charts of patients who had this disease, and you don't get your chart for patient care. I would have to apologize to the patients about 50% of the time. Mrs. Smith, it's good to see you again. What are we treating you for? Did I prescribe any medications? Did you have any questions for me? And she would say, yeah, I want to see your specialist in pulmonary. And he gave me some recommendations, but he said he was going to tell you what they were. Yeah, who, who was that? And, uh, and what do you remember that they told you? Because I don't know. I got a piece of paper with your vital signs on it from today, and your chart is locked away somewhere. And maybe tomorrow I'll get it, and then I can give you a call. So incredibly inefficient. Right? And now we have electronically always available, and now we're not scribbling anymore. Many of us are speech recognizing our notes right into the computer. And so we think in some ways things are better. We're across our 10 hospitals, about three of us, three of our hospitals are now adding wearables onto the patient. We can track numerous vital signs continuously and automatically and watch for deterioration. Right? If any of you have actually interacted with these devices, they're not. Uh, completely foolproof. Uh, there's quite a bit of issues with struggling with making sure that the re leads read properly and so forth. So it's not quite there, but it's coming. We've developed IQ, uh, something that uh, works in our operating suites where we're starting to allow the AI to look over our past history for scheduling in the OR so that instead of a typical block schedule where it has all these gaps in it from a typical day, we're able to use the patterns over the last three years and say, you know what, even though we block 45 minutes for this type of operation, turns out it only takes 32. We think we can narrow this down. And then also, we try to predict patterns of this clinician tends to not use some of their blocks on Tuesdays. Let's suggest to the system that we might readjust it so that people can bid for those blocks and so forth. And we've been able to eke out a lot more capability from our existing ORs based on big data learning of our system. If you've been on uchealth.org in the past week or so, we installed a brand new chatbot, Livy. So in the corner here, you'll see Livy's icon. And if you pop it up or if you sit on the website and, and don't do anything, it pops up and says, looks like you're stuck. Can I help you? And so it's asking, it's telling you, these are things that I can typically do for you. Right now, you can stump it very easily. Almost any question you ask it, I don't know. Let me find out. I'll, you know, I, I can't do that yet. But over time, as it gets smarter, we think not only navigational help, or once you get to our in incredible sprawling campus, we think we'll give navigational help for this is how you get to your clinic. And over time, we think we'll feed it with, um, with triage type of information. If you have these types of symptoms, I suggest a 911 call, versus if you have those types of symptoms, maybe you can call your doctor tomorrow. UC Health underwent a four-week dictation outage in 2017 when Nuance, our dictation vendor, had a, uh, an Eastern European hacker attack shut down their servers, locked them completely down for about a month. Um, of course, there are additional bad actors because the rumor went around our campus that I'm pretty sure C.T. Lin did this to us just to make us type in his effing EHR. <laughs> I actually did have to send out an official newsletter broadcast saying, Contrary to popular belief, I did not initiate uh, this so-called attack. So um, there are bad actors out there that we are affected by. We now have set up an entire building that's our virtual ICU with experienced uh, ICU nurses and physicians who are monitoring all of the metrics out of all of our hospitals and our critical care patients. So we have a second uh, safety view from um, experienced nurses and physicians who can call into the room and say, looks like your patient's having a hard time. You might want to go check on this lead. Doesn't look like it's reporting right. Or you know what? Their blood pressure has been trending lower. I know you've been busy with your two other patients, but pay attention to this, right? And so now we're able to use technology that's beyond the paper chart to be able to provide better care. We're doing sprints now. The electronic health record sprint, we're actually bringing in a team of about 10 people and retraining clinicians in use of electronic health record. This is sort of human connection and trying to increase the skills of those using the computer. We're doing practice transformation, and now we can have physicians and patients face-to-face -face and have an assistant deal with the technology of the computer so we're not 
as everyone's talking about in the country today, the doctor's not in the corner typing away and ignoring the patient, right? There's lots of articles about burnout and about why do we insert computers in there because it ruins the physician-patient relationship. Turns out there's ways of addressing that with empathy and with creativity and with connection. If you want to learn more, these are some of the books I've drawn from. Life 3.0 is a bestseller right now. Homo Deus is a brief history of tomorrow. The description of this technological singularity, the idea that um, just like with a black hole as you approach the center of, of mass and that information doesn't escape from, the, our, if our technology continues to escalate quicker and quicker, what's on the other side of that? What does that look like? Thank you for being late. I've mentioned before, drive is about uh, human drive uh, with, uh, what is it, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And what drives us and how can we bake these principles into the technologies we're building? And Abundance is actually both a book and a newsletter that you can sign up for that delivers practical advice on the things that are being, that are being developed uh, immediately. So now I think we've come to the end of uh, knowing that Moore's Law is coming for us, that technology is accelerating, and that we need to be very conscious about what we choose and that there are possible solutions for the road ahead. And thank you very much. Questions for C2 in a few minutes. I have one. Yes. Um, you and I have talked. Oh, no. Sorry. You and I have talked in the past about how long it's going to be before you're put out of a job by <laughs> compute. I thought you would want to share your thoughts with everyone here about um, how long will you be in your job before you lose your job to compute? <laughs> so it is, it's, so the question is about how long do I have my job before, before the, the AI comes for me? Um, there's, a, there's a TED talk uh, called uh, A Hole in the Wall Project. And so if any of you have watched videos on TED, you know that once you go in, you don't come out for a long time. Uh, Technology Entertainment Design is the conference that puts on these talks, and it's a 20-minute talk given by an um, Eastern Indian technologist whose company was established across the alley from um, an elementary school that ended up really being a daycare because there were no teachers. And so the kids would run around and be taken care of, but get no instruction for, over the course of the day. And his thought was, what would happen if I took one of my high-end PCs and a pointing pad and drilled into the mud wall that divides our company from that playground and just put a screen and a touchpad connected to the internet to these kids who know nothing about it? And so he did that. And as he was putting the thing in place, the kids would be like, hey, what, what are you doing? He goes, I don't know. Someone just told me to do this. He gave them no instructions and set up a video camera to watch what happened and walked away. And I won't give away the end because you have to go watch this yourself. But one idea is that um, if you put technology in the hands of kids, they'll figure stuff out. That's kind of the nature of curiosity. And um, at some point, he actually takes that technology to another place out in the, uh, out, somewhere else outside of metro, uh, um, yeah, the metro areas of India and sets up, um, has to de deliver his own electricity. So he puts up a solar panel, an electric cable, puts a PC with a um, CD drive that includes textbooks on biology and chemistry and so forth and leaves it. Doesn't teach him English, walks away and, oh, there's reference texts on English and so forth. And he comes back a month later and he says, well, what did you think? And the kids go, it's not very good. We, we didn't learn hardly anything, except the fact that the diversity of life is based on point mutations in the DNA. <laughs> That's about the only thing we got out of it, right? And so his point was Arthur C. Clarke's quote, right? If, um, if uh, how does it go? If a teacher can be replaced by technology, maybe it should be. And similarly for us, if in healthcare, what we can do can be mimicked and improved on by technology, maybe it should be. I don't know when that line will be crossed. Is it soon? Is it 2010? Is it 2030? Is it 2050? 
But I think it's common for us that algorithms can absorb much of how we take, uh, make decisions on. We're using robots now to do da Vinci robot surgery. And can we record what these expert surgeons are doing and then maybe replicate it based on what the video shows us and what the decisions were that the clinician makes at that time? I think it's replicable. Um, I'm hopeful that I'll finish out my career before that happens. Um, but I'm not sanguine that not everything won't go that way. If we are already using uh, Watson and other devices to diagnose skin cancers and to look at radiology findings, maybe components of what we do shift. And in fact, I'll, I'll answer one other question which you didn't ask is if you're a medical student in 2018, unlike being a medical student in 1989 where I can expect to go to medical school and residency and keep one job basically my whole life, I think a medical student this day and age will train for the first five years of a career and have to reinvent themselves for the next five and reinvent themselves for the next five and reinvent themselves for the next five. That's what I think. Please. Um, CT, thank you for the great talk. And the, um, the healthcare systems, opinion leaders, we are here, sometimes serve a role for health promotion effort. So it's a burden for physician to ask smoking and drinking, uh, opium use, but it's possible we can do something to use uh, behavior nudging, monitor those behavior, ask those behavior, and the EHR to promote health in health system. Thank you for that comment. Yes, uh, we, we do know that at least teenagers and probably all humans sometimes are more comfortable re revealing things about themselves to a computer than to a human, right? In our early research on patient portals where we're communicating online with patients, significant fraction, about 17% of our patients would say things like, well, I'm comfortable asking you this question here from, from in my pajamas from home about my depression and insomnia that I felt embarrassed to ask you to your face. And what is it about our systems that we could start making automation help ask those questions in a way that we gather better data so we can treat patients better. So thank you for that. Yes, just, please. Just a quick question. Seems that you're a father as well. So what's your recommendation regarding to our education focus for next generation? What should our education focus be for the next generation? Um, I, I think this answer would be true for whether you're in elementary school, high school, college, or, or beyond is more important than the facts that you know is how you learn and knowing how you best learn and keeping up with what's coming and reading broadly and thinking broadly. Because if you focus, hyper focus on your specialty or whatever you're, if you hold on to, well, this is the way I learned it, um, you're gonna be out of date. The technology acceleration pushes knowledge forward in many ways and it's not possible to be the expert on everything and to have humility and to realize that in order to continue to be gainfully employed because the, the environment around you is changing quickly is, is to keep your eyes open for the next opportunity and it won't be as stable as it used to be. So that's as far as I can tell you uh, at this point. Please. Um, thank you, Dr. Lin. And thank you for naming uh, at least one of my very favorite books, which is uh, Daniel Pink's Drive. Yes. It's an oldie but goodie. Um, because my brain now exists in this, I have no short-term memory. And could you just repeat the book about Stempathy, the name of that book? Yes, that's um, Thank You for Being Late. Um, uh, to your point, my brain also recalls nothing because I rely on my smartphone to be my external brain. And there's a, actually a book about this called The Shallows, what, our, what the internet is doing to our brains. Because... Um, Expert knowledge used to be decades of studying and memorizing facts so that when a question comes up that you haven't handled before, you'll say, well, I think I remember this from this principle, and if I add it to this principle, a couple of new facts, I come up with this new idea. And we think we may be less creative than we used to be because we go, well, don't worry, I can just look that up. And what ends up happening is when I go look that up, it's one of the top 10 hits on Google, and otherwise it doesn't exist. Right? I find very disappointingly that when I sit down with a book, it's a struggle not to get up and go, where's my iPad, where's my phone, I want to go look stuff up, and then I don't come back to the book for hours because I've clicked my way deep into the internet. And our, our focus isn't what it used to be. And I think that as humans, we need to hold on to. 
We need to learn how to read books again. We need to think about things deeply, and that's what the AI isn't very good at. It's going to give you the most top, the top ranked page rank links to the most popular websites, but it's not going to give you deep thinking um, in a creative manner. Please. Thank you for that because um, thank you for being late. Is actually in my office on a table, and I didn't realize it was the book about sympathy. I just haven't, <laughs> I haven't gotten to past chapter one yet. So thank you for that. If there are no more questions, I do have a ukulele song for you. Oh, yes. <laughs> so in case the talk doesn't go over well, I do usually play a song. Um, and has anyone ever heard me sing before? My apologies. Your ears were probably bleeding, and I'm, you're probably going to do it again. So this is a song, a parody song, about the electronic health record. How popular is that? Um, that I played for our IT team. If you can imagine 2011, February, we're turning on Epic for 900 physicians and thousands of staff on one day, one cutover day. And we have 50 red shirts, those of us wearing red vests and red, red scrubs, indicating that we're experts and can help you and we're wandering around the hospital and all we hear are complaints because we've moved everyone's cheese Right? You moved my cheese. Used to be here. Where's, it? Where's my prescription pads? You took away my pencils. I, I, I hate all of this. Right? And so that's all you hear. And sometimes I, I watch as we answer the phones, and some of the red shirts are going, yes, doctor. Yeah, yes, sir. No, no, sir. And you're, you're, you, because people are pretty unhappy. At the end of the first week, we had fielded 7,000 separate complaints about the EHR. And so on a Friday afternoon, I thought I would have them laugh at me by playing this song. <laughs> There is a hospital in Colorado. They call the rising sun. And it's been the ruin of many a poor doc. And God, I know that I'm one. For the only thing that a doctor needs is a paper sheet and a pen to write a prescription hard to read and ever on its way, he says. One day we saw computer screens Replacing those old charts. The floors swarmed with eager red shirts. No place for us old farts. Oh, mother, tell your children not to do what I have done. I've ignored those alerts and reminders in the hospital of the rising sun. But then something changed in the air one night. Those handoff errors, we had none. No bad handwriting in those charts in the hospital of the rising sun oh i got one foot in my deep dark past and one foot in the car i'm going back to colorado to be an, an epic star there is a hospital in Colorado. They call the rising sun, and it's been the savior of many a poor dog. And God, I know that I'm one. Thank you. Thank you.